I just pressed record. I just pressed record. Um, okay. Let me share my screen. Ready to see it? Everybody hear me all right? Yep, yep, we can hear and see you. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for coming um, to the Super Facility API training as part of the NOC annual meeting. Uh, we are Nick and Bjorn. Nick is part of the Data and I Services group, and I'm part of the Data Science Engagement group here at NERSC, and we will guide you to this tutorial. Um, and just as a heads up, if you ever want to look at one of these slides as we're going through, a link to these slides is in the calendar invite. Uh, so please go and, and take a look and you know skip ahead or go back as you as you please. All right. So um this workshop uh will prepare you to use the NERSC API for your projects. So we go um about we're gonna tell you about the API, uh, why we made it and how it's used in project. We are gonna tell you how to get tokens to use the API. We uh, tell you a bit how to uh, work with the API interactively over its uh, Swagger page, which is the, the page that documents uh, all the API endpoints. Uh, we tell you how to interact with the API in Python uh, with a slim wrapper in Jupyter. So if you ever think of, you know, you, that that you want to use the API uh, with Python, write your own Python code for it. We're going to give you a little guidance about this. Uh, but we also tell you in the very end how to use um, the nurse provided uh, SF API client library uh, to use in your projects. Um, so what you would need for this training, and I hope everyone came with a laptop or some access to a computer, is you need, need a working nurse account or at least a nurse training account. Uh, you can, if you get access to Jupyter, you're fine. So you, we, we, we encourage you to go and create a login node session at jupyternurse.gov. They will also provide you with a terminal, but you can do it on your, you know, you can work with the terminal on your laptop as well. And if you, if you have internet access there. Um, so what you will need uh, for this training uh, moreover, is you need uh, to understand a bit how Python works. Um, you need to understand a bit how JavaScript works, but I think all our NERSC users do have a, a rough understanding for JavaScript. Um, and then, of course, this is the first um, user tutorial for the API. So it might not go over as smoothly as many of our other tutorials at right at NERSC. So uh, please be patient with us. And then if you spot anything that you can see that uh, that needs improvement or if you have any opinion, uh, we'd like to hear from you afterwards. And if you're courageous <laughs> and uh, and a person likes to talk about their projects, we can also just drop in the chat now, if you like, why you want to use an API, uh, why you want to use the NERSC Publicity API or tell us a bit uh, like in which projects you want to use it. I would be interested to hear. You we'll probably include this in the survey that we send out later, but you know, just pop it in the chat if you feel like it. I would just be interested to read it later on. Okay, so we put uh, all the demos, and all the training material, on Nurse GitHub. So if you just go to GitHub.com Nurse SF API training, you find all the notebooks that we use for this uh, uh, tutorial. And then you can just, and then we advise you to just clone it uh, to parameter or local computer. So um, I think the first action here is that everyone tries to get a login out session um, on parameter now uh, uh, with Jupyter, JupyterNurse.gov, and tries to download the, the, the material. I will show you that live in, in a second. And um, if you if you if you finish with this in your board, you can also uh, create a custom environment and install the libraries that you will need for the client library later. 
Um, so let me show for all of you how to to get the material, and let's hope it works as it did just a minute before. Um, so share screen. I believe most of you have seen Jupiter Hub. So you sign in. Probably it's cached my credentials. It did. Otherwise, you'd have to type in uh, your credentials now. Um, I already have a session, but let me just for the sake of this exercise, just stop it and, and make a new one. So you don't see all this. <laughs> so usually you have a little less buttons, uh, but you should have the permuter login node uh, button for your Jupyter. Okay, uh, and what you would need to do now is you would need to um, copy the training material. That should have created a folder for you called um, SFAPI test. It's for your training. There you go, and you know just cd into the into the directory, and then we'll uh, we'll meet you there. So I, I think that's that's everything you have to do. Um, and I would uh, give now or maybe like five to ten minutes for people to catch up. Please look at the slides. Please ask questions if you haven't uh, reached this uh, checkpoint. Um, you can do it in the chat or you know just just speak up. If you have an, if, if you have any issues, I'd say can you increase the font size so people can see it in the room? Excuse me. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Sorry. 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 That's the. But this is, these instructions are also in the slides, so you you know find it there. Is there a way to increase just the terminal font size in Jupyter? I'm not sure. Go to settings. Oh. <laughs> now we can read it. It windows. I also put up this slide for downloading the training material here.
So yeah, nine twenty. We continue at nine twenty. <clears throat> How does it look in the room, Nick? Are people twiddling the thumbs or? people pretty good in here? Yeah, I think we're all good in here. Okay. And then online, anyone has not opened a Jupyter Notebook and downloaded the training material? Um, sounds like it now. So let's continue. I'll switch the screen. Okay, we'll talk now a bit about the background, the API bit. So, um, I always show this slide. It's kind of this uh, analysis that NERSC has done a, a while ago, but essentially, it's um. It, this slide describes mainly that NERSC deals with a lot of projects that um, the who self-identifies the primary role of this project is to either analyze experimental data or create tools for data analysis or combine experimental data with simulations and modeling. And not only uh, do these projects uh, do this kind of work, which is very data-centric and uh, um, and very much based on analysis, they they also are from uh, from facilities uh, themselves. So they are like user groups from um, like for example LCS, the Linear Query and Light Source at Slack, or the Advanced Light Source here at Berkeley Lab, or from the National Center of Electron Microscopy here at Berkeley Lab, or they're doing um, you know as, as, uh, work with telescopes. And essentially, they have this all this problem. They need to you know. They collect data, they need to analyze it, and they use supercomputing resources um, for this particular work. And this is where um, the, the overall idea of the super facility came from. So the super facility is uh, an ecosystem of connected facilities, software and expertise uh, to able new modes of discovery. So we, we, we realized that this all, all these facilities and all this um, uh, uh, work all these workflows have to work together seamlessly, and you kind of and the supervisory project was to facilitate um, these workflows and uh, to make it just just uh, just like better for the science, better experience for the scientist. And uh, the supervisory API, so it's called SF API because it's supervisory API, and the API was one. Request from the user community, from, from the user community, and that essentially means that uh, if you if you have an API that um, for Nurse that you can use to do all the things you do at Nurse, and you can embed it into your own systems, um, that means that it's e much easier to uh, to use Nurse uh, for your cross facility workflows. And then, but as we went on, we realized that we also want the API to be like a general purpose API uh, for all nurse users and projects, not only for our um, uh, special super facility partners. And that's really um, where the API is now. It's a general purpose API uh, for all nurse users and projects. So um, I'm going to go through a model use case. Um, where the API can be used, or what's the difference between like a, a workflow without API and, and with the API, and that's and I use them the model cases where I'm from. I'm from a from synchrotron community, you know, uh, from the PhD and postdoc. So this is a, a work a workflow that I can identify with, but I probably also people that work with telescopes can identify with 
um, with his, his uh, workflows. So essentially, uh, you run experiments or you run observations at some external facility um, with uh, where a lot of data comes in. Like for synchrotrons, it's like high frame rate detectors. And this is the amount of uh, data that comes in and the amount of compute or analysis that you have to do with this has simply become uh, too demanding uh, to do on site. Or you do not actually have the resources to uh, prop up a whole computing group for your facility to do this. And um, what you want to do is, if you want to include NERSC in your in your workflow, imagine you want to say, okay, I want to ship it over to NERSC and run my jobs. There's a few things you would need to do uh, to figure out if if that actually works for you. Uh, first thing would be that you need to plan and check if NERSC resources are available. So this is like the action item would be to check status or check if you have enough compute no, um, hours in your accounts, then you would want to move the data over. Um, then you want to start a job, you know, when the data arrives and you want to, you know, monitor that job. And then um, when the job's completed, you might want to, you know, download a small you know, results file or you want to um, do some other form of feedback. And then after the job is done, you might want to move data back or you want to maybe uh, move it to uh, to the archive. And um, so when you when you look at this, the requirements for um, for this are that you know HPC must be a reliable partner for this. So you have to have machine ready status. You know you need to form some form of resiliency. That means you need to provide compatible compatible inter interface. And we're currently in discussion with other HPC facilities to see if they can use the same API. Um, and there are some other components that's not really part of the API, but that was like, you know, the, the requirements we got from the Super City project. So um, why would you need an API? So the API, um, as I alluded to, it kind of needs a critical need. You, you want, if, if you get more and more data and you want to uh, analyze it offsite, you need to, and or you want to analyze it at all, you need to introduce some form of automation. And that means that, you know, there's data coming, it triggers, you know, some analysis loop, and you don't want to have a human, you know, pressing the button all the time. So you have some unintended operation, you want to track all these jobs, you want to um, interface with other collaborations, workflows and machines. And um, if you want to do all this, you need, you need NERS to become a machine readable. And this is kind of where the API stems from. It's where, that's uh, where we designed uh, the API. And the other thing uh, also why we made an API, and you, because we already had like new before, is that um, you know, with fast API and uh, RESTx from Flask, it just become uh, very easy today to build APIs. And uh, that's also one of the triggers for us to say, let's, let's do it uh, with like standard tooling and, and, and modern uh, libraries. And that's where the, uh, the uh, SFAPI comes from. So ideally you wanna have something like this, you know, an experimental observation facility is connected to an HPC facility and the, 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 the fact that you can embed the API into your the effect that you can steer the HPC facility with an API makes makes it easy to integrate it, you know, locally in your workflow. So the the vision for the API is that all NERSC interactions um, are callable, and it would facilitate automated like NERSC inside kind of workflows without any human in the loop. And uh, we drafted a number of endpoints. You have to see them to the to, to the left here, and we'll go over them, you know, briefly later too. Like a status endpoint to check, you know, status accounting for, you know, for how much hours you still have in the bank. You know, compute obviously to run a job, storage to move data. The task endpoint is a bit counterintuitive, but we figured that the API cannot be synchronous. So if whenever you do something that requires uh, some action on the back end, it will be shifted into the, it will be recorded as a task and you query uh, the process, the progress of the task over the task endpoint. And then of course you wanna have some, uh, you know, machine utilities. 
And uh, here's an example request. For example, you can use you need to use curl and just hit the endpoint um, status parameter, and then you would ideally get um, you know a JSON formatted uh, response back. And you know terminus active or degraded or some of the, uh, of the sort. And uh, the API is not only is not only meant to be used externally. We also use it internally for uh, for our services. For example, if you ever see if you ever saw in Jupyter, you know this little yellow box uh, that links you. You know so there's something wrong or you are having issues. Just because Jupyter itself is uh, querying the API to find out what the status of uh, specific services is. All right, and here is uh, like another table to compare how you would do it without API and with API. So for example, if you want to check the status, you would do SSH of ping services. Now you can hit the status endpoint as a you know submit a job, S batch and SQ after you SSH in, but now you can hit compute and the past endpoint. Um, if you want to know when the next outage is, you know, if you, you know, as a human, you would go to the nurse MOTD, this life status page. But uh, as a machine, you can hit uh, the status outages plan endpoint, and then you would will tell you of all the outages of the services that we have. Um, with data, you can do the storage endpoint and then all the, uh, you know, check the your your um, our balance. Would log into Iris and you know go to the various tabs to find out how many CPUs, how many GPUs you have, and now you can do this with the account endpoint. So you can fill this in, and you see that for this particular model use case, now it's a model use case, so it, of course it's been, it's chosen so it, uh, that you can can see all the all the different API endpoints. But you see that you now plan check its status endpoint um, with data for storage, and let's drop compute and task. And then uh, for downloading like a small file, you can go to utilities download, moving data to storage, uh, to ar archive, do again uh, with the storage endpoint. Okay, so uh, part of the, as what came, what came out of the Super City project is that we, you know, we launched the API gradually and guided uh, users to use it and train them um, individually. So um, since the release, um, in 2022, um, there were 27 non-staff users that made, cl made clients and it's used on 40 non-staff uh, projects. And this doesn't sound like a lot because NERSC has like 7,000 users, but every user who uh, starts building against the API usually builds a workflow for their facility or for their beam line. So it usually is, is used um uh, quite often and it's used by it is actually federates the access from the user so they the users use you know whatever um a tool they developed and that tool in turn uses the api so it doesn't really um it's, it's not it's not quite quite fair this user comparison so it actually it, there's a lot of uh, um action going on with the api and this can be um can be seen by the number of requests so from 2022, May 22 until February 23, uh, 2023, uh, we had 12 uh, million uh, requests. And that's roughly one request every two seconds. I haven't checked um, the recent numbers, but I'm pretty sure we are there still. Um, so LCS uh, at Slack uses it for automated data pro processing for serial diffraction and scattering workflows, NSEM. They build uh, an app called Distiller, which is a catalog app where they can essentially, uh, you know, look at the data sets, press a button, and that says, you know, I want to have, I want to run the reduction pipeline at NERSC, and it moves the data over and, and uses the API to run the reduction job. And D3D is a fusion facility in San Diego, and they also use it for automated data processing uh, in between uh, plasma shops. If you if you ever have any questions, um, you can just um, raise your hand or or tell Nick that you want to have, that you have a question, so he can interrupt me anytime. Um, so that was for the motivation for the project that used the API today. And I'll give like a very brief 
um, technical overview. So the API, you can see, you can hit the API at api.mas.gov, API and then version 1.2, that's our current version. And if you do this, you will present it uh, with a Swagger page, which is our which is our interface documentation page, also, which can also be used for interactively, you know, um, check out the API and you'll run, um, run your own uh, commands or run your own uh, gets and put and posts. And um, yeah, you can you can see all the endpoints, payloads, and example code. And uh, because it run, runs in a browser, it works in any dev environment too. Um, so it's very much based on standards, and we have extensive documentation here at docs.gov slash API. So if you want to go a bit more in depth, uh, you can just go go there, and that should be um, you know the most um, up to date. Mm -hmm. Uh, information. Um, so we use a, a, a job based authentication scheme and the, the way it runs, um, you know, you are you are the user here with the smiley face. You, you um, the first what you do is you cre create a, um, a, call, a client in the, in the interface and we do it uh, right after this technical demonstration. And then um, you change this client for an access token with our nurse uh, OITC server, and then you use that token uh, to access the, the API. And um, you know, the API is in its base, it's a, it's a thin layer of, uh, around most of our services. Um, for example, you know, it it just it's a thin, it will access the Iris API or it will access uh, Slurm. And whenever you you do a task that is uh, too much to handle, or that the API thinks that this is probably something that it can do synchronous, it will um, um, it will return not the result of your um, call, but it will return like a task ID, and then you create the task ID uh, to figure out what's what's going on with the job, and all these tasks are stored uh, internally in a message queue. And um, we use Redis and Postgres uh, databases to facilitate all the that work. And then uh, the fun part is, you know, our API is hosted uh, at NERSC itself, so we host it and and spin. And all these, uh, the idea is, you know, with with this thin wrapper and uh, and the endpoints, we hope to. Um, to build a very simple API that kind of hides the com complexity uh, to interacting with NERSC. Um, okay. I, I was, okay, let's go through it anyway. We have it later too as in the slide, but let's do it anyway. So what, what happens if you want to use the API, the, the process flow is that you first create the client, uh, which calls connect ID to create a client, and then um, and then what and then you get a client ID and key pair, and then you need to store safely just like an SSH credential, and then once you exchange those for an access token, and then use the token to um, to actually so this is just the iris and connect ID, but then once you have a token, you could go on the API layer, and then uh, when you um, post something to compute jobs that will be registered as something that's probably run asynchronously because the you know we know that we've submitted a job it will go into the uh, the batch queue right so will be your action will be stored in the message queue and databases and then in the back end there is some some dynamic between um, Slurm and that message queue that runs you know independent of your uh, submission to the API. So the submission comes directly back with a task ID, and then you use the task ID to query uh, what's going on behind the scenes. And once you uh, get the job ID, uh, you can also you can go in and, and check out um, S count SQ uh, type um, information with the API. Okay, so. 
uh, now we're going to take a look at how to create an API client. And um, this will require you to access Iris. So um, uh, the, the API itself uh, is divided into a part that is public and a part that requires authentication. And let me just go quickly back. Yeah. Ah, it's not on this one. Okay, I will show you in the Swagger page. But there is actually, if you look at the interface page, there are some endpoints that have like a lock on it. And that means that these requires that you need authentication. Some of them will not have a lock on it. And that is primarily meta and status. This is public information, so you don't need any authentication at all. And you don't need to create a client or anything. But for the authenticated part, uh, you need to create a client in, in Iris. Because essentially, a token is a way uh, to bypass MFA. And we need to make sure that you use MFA to get access to NERS. So it has to go through Iris. In Iris, you log in with uh, with MFA. And then you and then that in Iris, you create um, your your credentials that will be used in the API later. Um, so you you go to Iris profile supervised API clients. And then you can create a new client that will uh, give you uh, all of client credentials that you need to download and save install in the safe place. And I will show you in a bit. And then uh, with that, you um, you sign a client assertion with a private key and you exchange that for an access token. This looks rather maybe a bit convoluted, um, but there is uh, libraries that will do all these things for you. So you only really need to uh, download, the, create the, the client credentials, uh, download it, and then we'll and use it uh, with like a standard library. You can and, and pull an access token from that. Bjorn, we have a question yeah. in the room. Hi. Right, so I, in the past, when we used the Super Facility API, the the JGI team had asked that there be a longer lifetime on the Iris. Yes. Script. Has that been, have you guys been able to do any work on that? Um, you mean longer than 30 days? Yeah, because we have, uh, the reason we ended up not using it is because logging in every 30 days to Iris, generating that credential and then putting it back into our infrastructure was considered onerous compared to the other ways we had been doing it in the past. And so there was some discussion about using a templated jobs and having templated jobs and sort of locking down the credential to certain IP range. Yeah, that That's discussion all. is is still ongoing. And we're looking for, for technical, technical solutions to this. But yeah, the idea to use templated jobs or containers to lock down the, the actions that you can do uh, and then in exchange for longer lifetimes. Um, but this is still, it's still an active field uh, for us because that's the, the, the way that as we created the, all the uh, endpoints, we did, did a thorough security review and that's why the, the client interface is, is now a bit more complicated than it was before. And but it also gives you a bit more power in you know, exchange for less powerful client credentials. You get more, more days, but you want, you want, what you want is like, a something that can submit a job or like something run a specific command, right? And then do it, do it for like 90 days or something, right? Uh, well, we run them, we used to run them all the time. So we'd want it, you know, as long as you'd be willing to give it to us, because <laughs> it'd be doing this, submitting the same kind of jobs over and over just with different parameters. Sorry, what, sorry, you did miss the, uh, the past bit. The same job over and over, except with a different file name as the parameter. So we right. want to run, we want to have a token that could last like a while. Right. <laughs> However long you do, like, give it to us. Well, yeah, I think as we are we are still working on it, so it's not forgotten, and we kind of want to want to go and ultimately enable this yeah. because it's a requirement for more users. But it's 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 really difficult to marry these request these requests with um, what we what we're told from you know headquarters about how how to run a secure HPC center, right? So it's not it's it's kind of it kind of bites because essentially what what it, what these what these credentials are they uh, they're bypassing mfa so we need needs to be um you know there need to be some other um measures in place that you can't have shenanigans with it so you know 
so if they're getting getting a client, they cannot can do everything. You now that obviously you can't do for for a long time. But yeah, we're looking into containers and templates to get actually to kind of lock this down in exchange for longer lifetime. But it's a uh, um, it's a long process to get there. And maybe we can lobby the IRI program manager to lobby for longer lifetime purchases. <laughs> Sorry. We can uh we can ask our IRI if we can uh get some longer lifetime tokens. I think it'll interfere with IRA projects as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think if where if it I'm I'm not quite sure if it builds enough momentum to change like you know the mind of like the you know the upper echelons, but it would be great if if, <laughs> if we can say like, oh for these particular use cases you can give out longer longer lifetime. Credentials, yeah, that would be just fantastic if it came out of IRI. But I also have a long list of things I want to want to have from IRI too. You know, like a centralized. For example, why would we have like a you know what? For, for example, there's no centralized authority you know to give out um, a centralized identity server. Why we have our own Globus has their own, every facility has their own. It makes it difficult to trust uh, each other's tokens. It would be great if there would be like one centralized. Identity. Uh, you know, the dimension server that can give out the tokens and every facility accepts them. That would be something I want from IRI. I mean, Maybe we should not put this on the record. We should delete this later from this recording. <laughs> if you're willing to use grid certificates, <laughs> do something like this. <laughs> well, let's not go there. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway. Uh, those that were bored by this discussion might have read already the, the right um, part of this slide. So uh, if you want to create your own client, you go to ISMS Gov profile tab, you scroll all the way down to super facility clients. It's really, it's really uh, hidden a bit. And then you can um, press new client to create a new client. You can give it a name. Uh, it doesn't really quite matter which, it's just for you. Uh, you can add comments also just for you. And, but I think one thing to point out for, you know, as a default, it, it will select yourself, but you can select any collab user, collaboration account user you have access to. And that is particularly relevant for cases where you are like a number of people who manage kind of the same service. Then you want to have the data being processed in a collaboration account's name. And you also want to be able to uh, you know, everyone should be able to uh, create new credentials for this service. You should better use a collaboration account uh, for this. Um, for this, sorry. Okay, so um, yeah, we we um, we had to do a thorough security review for the API client, and then what? But what we came up with, I think, was better than what we had before in the initial release, and. Um, so now you can determine um, a bit, you can trade a bit, you know, the potency of your client versus the lifetime. So if, for example, if you are a general user, just a general user, right? And you want to have, you want to submit jobs or run a, a specific command, that is kind, is kind of akin to, you know, getting an SS, a, a, a credential from SSH proxy, right? That's 24 hours, but from the API will allow two days and two IP ranges that you can use that credentials from. And um, that will give you like full access. But if you if you dial a little bit down, um, you could uh, have like more IP ranges. So you have like a larger set of computers or more diverse set of computers using the same uh, credentials to access NERS. Um, and it can, it lasts for longer, but uh, as you, get from red to green, you will also uh, lose capability. So you will, not, you will not be able to hit every endpoint. And um, yeah, you will not you'll be able to do like everything that the API uh, can do. So this is something that we let, we, are, we, uh, we leave to the user to decide because we had a diverse set of use case. Some people want to go with monitoring apps that span you know, large collaborations and then have a diverse set of IP addresses they want to use for it. They want to use for it. So that's like, you know, on the green side of it. And then we have people who want to, you know, do everything with it. And that's on the red side. And um, we, we don't want to um, hold people back that uh, that want to do uh, actions in the red regime. 
So we, we still allow for security review there. So if you want to, if you say, I'm, I'm a worker tools developer for this facility, my, my tool needs to do uh, easy submit job or run any command, you can still um, go through a, a security rule. It's like a discussion with us in which you kind of lay out what you intend to do and that we can decide whether or not that fits with our um, um, security stance. And then if you, if you think that, that it does, we will permit a 30 days red token for the person who went through security review. Um, okay, so when if you if you went through that uh, UI, what you in the end you will be given um, you will be shown this uh, pop up which has API client details. So it gives you like a private key in JSON format and pem form in, in pem format, uh, along with a client ID. And these these the private parts are the sensitive parts. So um, you should treat it like an SSH key. Uh, you know, make sure that only you can access it by shmodding it to six zero zero. You know, store it into safe places. You know, don't put it like somewhere where everyone can read it. Um, and for those of you who use bin, um, storing API credentials as bin secret is a permitted uh, way of storing them. If you want easy access, you can just for just for the session just put them in as environment variables. But really don't don't put them in Jupyter notes. I did this in the past. Don't do this. You know, <laughs> that was just for demonstration purposes. But if you if you're building something out, make sure that these key that these keys are hidden. Okay, let's uh, show you a key. Okay, you can see my uh, my iris. Yeah, we can I'm see in iris. the profile tab. Huh? Oh, just continue. Yeah, you're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have two I have two screens. Uh, so I wanna uh, that's why I have to always stop share and switch over because I didn't want to have presenter view in this case. Okay, you're in the profile tab. You go all the way down, and at the very bottom, uh, super facility API clients. You hit new client. You know. You can give it any name. <clears throat> Let's call it not training. So this is the part where we are supposed to follow. Yeah, and you can to do it in our account. Yeah, you can follow along. Uh, yeah, that will. We'll just give you time to do it. Uh, you can go to uh, pick the security level. Here it's red. So you can see, I have thirty days here because I, I'm approved. <laughs> I'm approved to to get these clients for thirty days. But you know, if you if you haven't gone through the security, you will be two days for you, and then uh, you can you can you know specify your IP address ranges and add them here with the plus button. But we also have some presets, and you know, permanent nodes is one preset, and you go on to okay. And now this will be your client client details. I can download them. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop sharing this iris bit. Apologies, and then go over to the main screen again. So this is how you create a this is how you create a client, and now it's time. Um, for you to do it yourself, you go to Iris, you go to Profile, Simplicity, create a client. And I want you all to create a red client uh, with uh, with a preset, with a preset permanent. If you're using Jupyter, just use permanent nodes. You don't need to do, add UIP. And uh, I named it training rate or not training rate. It doesn't really matter. Just like you name it something that's, uh, that makes sense to you. Uh, download the private key. Um, and then do the same things, but also create a yellow and a green client. You now, because we want to see the differences, in the user interface now will interact with the with the API. You don't need to do both 
but just to make one make one key that has at least a little less privileges than than the red one. Uh, yeah, one client that has less privileges than the red client. And uh, I'll give you maybe five minutes again to complete this task. And Nick will look around the room as everyone has finished, <laughs> and yeah. then and then we'll check online how 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 people are doing there. I'm unable to select the color and position the green, yellow, orange, red. Oh, you can drag it. Yeah, yeah you drag it along. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I should get my specs up. <laughs> Yeah, so for step five, if you're on Jupyter on Perlmutter, then you can use just the Perlmutter nodes. Um, but if you want to use your, your own laptop, you can use uh, your IP address and it'll find your IP address and where you're going to use. Uh, it is a drop down oh, okay. in the thing. So if you select, there's like a couple different drop downs. So there's an automatic drop down for Perlmutter nodes, um, for spin nodes, um, and then your own IP range. So you can't rename your client ID once created, and is this uh, random name you need to keep it somewhere, or just ignore that? The the name is really just for your own, so you know where what key it is so maybe you have a, a key that was for spin and you want to make sure that you just know that's for spin or you have a key that's for your laptop and know that it's on your laptop right. so that's just a naming convention for you it's for you to differentiate the the, the clients the random string and the client id is something that's on the oidc server so that you can't change that we will need we need later to exchange it to get the access token And uh, this the slide set can be downloaded from somewhere. Yeah, if you're on the um, uh, calendar invite, it should be attached there. Uh, and if you're not, I can give it to you. Yeah, I can give it to Mr. Dukista. So. How are people doing there, Nick? Up here, do people still click buttons or are people bored? Uh, everyone's kind of good in the room. Yeah, we got some thumbs up in the room. I think we're good. Okay. All right. Uh, let me. Okay. So now we're gonna uh, 
create uh, we're going to create a token. Um, so the the access token, the extra thing that you will use to get anything from the authenticated part of the API, only have a short lived lifetime, only ten minutes. You know your client credentials. You know last from two days to sixty days, but the access token will only last ten minutes. Um, so you know if you you get the tokens by signing in the client assertion to NERS or IDC server, and um, in your in the doc, in the Jupyter notebooks that you just downloaded, you should see someone with a uh, uh, um, a notebook that's called token. Um, and in this notebook, we will use the author. Uh, Python library to uh, do all these bits. You know, you get where you where client assertion is being created and sent to the OIC server, and you get an um, access token in return. So that will all happen in that uh, notebook, and it's very short. Uh, there's also a way to do this with command lines, so you don't actually need Python or Jupyter uh, to do this. It's very it's very um, you know standard practice, and we do have it in our docs. Uh, we uh, it was it was shown that. You know, doing showing this to do this with command line tools is a bit too much for the audience. So I'll just refer you to the docs where this is, um, you know, detailed to do it with command line. We just do it with Python now. Okay, so I'm tempted to do this live. That's the wrong one. Uh, sorry about that. This is the right one. Okay, what you see here now is um, the API training folder in my Jupyter. And I uploaded uh, all the um, the keys here. Uh, you should mod them to 600, uh, but you know, you can just uh, I leave this an exercise to the user. So now what uh, what we need to do is we need to uh, use the credentials to uh, get an access token. And the token should already, the token notebook should already have like everything in place for you. Uh, I just named them here red and yellow uh, for me. So I have to adjust it in here. Why is it not working? So there's, there's two ways you can either, either in, in JSON format or in PEM format. And you see here they have come uh, there. There's the credentials are in the files, but the client ID is not. So we go to, to Iris um, to figure out the client ID. For red, it was this one. So I'm using the red token here. Private key red, private key red. So you can the, either you can JSON or the PEM formatted one. Uh, this they don't differ much in how you use them in Python in this case. So you can use either way. So you can uncomment uh, one bit and not use the other ones. This just uh, why is it all weirded out for me? Okay, well never mind. We'll just overwrite the other one. Just press uh, execute, and if all goes well. Um, you get the the token uh, back from the OIC server. It's like a JSON formatted thing. It has many components. One is the access token, but it also has uh, the scope, which is the color of the token and the IP range in it, and who the use for which user it was crafted. Also tell you uh, when it expires. So this is uh, six hundred seconds, or it will give you in the in this universal time uh, when it expires. So you can use that actually to to initiate a new fetch of the token if you compare it, you know, with your current time. So you don't actually have to to go through the whole thing, but some people just just you know, just make a new old session every time and just to get the access token. It's fine too. If you um, do a refresh of your access token, does that invalidate any existing one that might exist? Like if I have multiple clients that are using the same client ID and client secret, um, and they are both trying to refresh, would 
does the OITC server, can it accommodate multiple access tokens and expire them individually or how does that That's work? That's a very good question. Um, I would say yes, because it still works even if you execute this multiple time, you know, right after another from the same location. Okay. Um, but let, let me put a pin in this. Let me let me ask, um, you know, how this is handled. Yeah. Thanks. I've not heard of any complications yet. Um, I'm also not entirely sure how or the auth library does it underneath. Maybe it just always sends the same stuff. It just like stores some things internally so it doesn't have to, you know, redo uh, part of the pipeline. So it could be, you know, it's just once you have a signed client assertion, you can ask for an access top. It doesn't really matter how often you ask for it. Okay. Yeah. But for many people, if you do some, if you do some, um, if you do work with the API at some point to say, you know, when when you when you work interact with the API at some point it says like it's it's you get like a forbidden or, or something is wrong with your access token, that often means that your token expired. Like for example, if you go in the Swagger UI, you will paste in your token, the access token, and then I think can use it. And then only for, it only lasts 10 minutes for you. And then you would have to paste in your token. You know, because you only put back in the session cookie for the or uh, for that um in the browser the token you put in only lasts for 10 minutes so you have to get a new one that sometimes people is is unusual is um i say yeah unusual for people yeah Okay. Um, let's. How, how are people doing the room? People are still. This should be. Um, is anyone trouble getting getting to the access token bit of the Jupyter notebook? Uh, no, but I have a question as well. Um, so we mm -hmm. saw how to take the client from, uh, in this case, Iris, um, from kind of like the web browser. Is there a way to create a client from command line? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that is uh, is done by design mm -hmm. because we want people to go through MFA and, you know, have that creating a client credential there has to be this the this the human input in it. That's kind of the security stance on the on these things. Um, there we will um, there will be some way, for example, if you build it's not finished yet, but we want to have another mode to access the API except from apart from having these clients and that's having it uh, through if you if for example if you build a, a web app you can still be able to use the API, but it's a different avenue to get create credentials. But then your web app has to be fronted by something that, you know, where you type in your you know, login and your MFA. And then underneath it will do, um, it will get tokens for you. But we I will see. not not have like an automated command line thing to, in this case. Um, I see. No, that makes sense. Thank you. It the, the use case that I was thinking about is something that uh, might be multi-tenant, but um, a bit out of the scope as well of the training today. Yeah, we we, we don't have that capability yet. Well, we want to make it, you know, we want to go through this. We want to include the science gateway a mode for the API and that, you know, where people build apps for their user base and then that, that will require, you know, that, will, that the tokens can, the access tokens can be, uh, retrieved in a different manner. We've got a couple questions in the room as well. Okay, just go ahead. Yes, maybe a naive question, but why can't you do some sort of command line version of this with just password plus OTP or something like that? I mean, if they, it's already allowed for SSH proxy, so I don't understand the difference in security. Yeah, I know, I know that's, it's a bit, there's, that that's um, you know SSH proxy is kind of grandfathered in the API has been has been viewed as you know be compliant with you know as 
with with the new security stands as we go forward. You know, SH proxy only gives you twenty four hour credentials, right? Yeah, we it gives you two days or longer. No. Trade SSH proxy virus client. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I just, I understand, I understand that point. You know, maybe in the future we might, we might get a look at it. But this, for now, this was not. We, we couldn't, we couldn't provide a command line way to get it for you. I think, I, I think we thought about doing one. If you get like this, um, if you get a, a different, the other avenue to get the access tokens for you, like from the, like the, like from the science gate multi tenancy kind of app point of view. At this point, you could um, you could uh, think about putting that into the command line. So it will be it will behave like a safe proxy in the sense, in the sense. But we don't have that build out yet. So for now, it's a no, but it's not necessarily you know a no for for all future. <laughs> yeah. But if you know if it, if it's be if it's be command line, we very much like twenty four hour SH proxy kind of. Away. Sorry, these are my nephews. Any other questions in the room? Nope, that was it. Okay. Well, thanks for all the feedback. And you know, we heard this before. <laughs> this is the best. This is the best we can do. It's like there's been some internal debate about this. I can tell you, it took it took a long time. To get where we are now, and I think it's a good compromise, but you know some users you know, still disagree here. Okay, um, get your um, you get your access token, and now actually I have it. I have some slides, but you don't really need this here. Can just go to um let me just get a new one right away. So now you can copy the token and now what I did wrong. Okay. And we go to the swagger page. I should increase the font size here too. So this is where you go API address gov, API version of N2. And then you can click on authorize, and here you can paste in your your token. And you see that a bunch of these endpoints uh, don't have the lock to it, so your meta and status are public, but everything else is uh, is private. You know, now thinking about this, I should have probably chosen a neutral account rather than mine, but. Um, So you can make it go user here. Should I think execute with my default one? Ah, great. Oh, now I know what is wrong. Ha. Huh. Okay. Oh well. So I just got. I just got. You know. When <laughs> I um. So, so no. the 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 browser runs with my IP here locally, and it correctly identified that this is not the IP range that I created the token with. So I apology. I apologize. I should have just been a bit more strict with myself when reading through my own slides. But and honestly, I have this this token here. Uh, I would need to I would need to make a new one and add um, and add my own IP to it in order to be used for Swagger. So you take mine. Yeah, so that's a little bit subtle thing of when you're using the web interface, it's your local IP address. Yeah. I think it's worth showing that this can happen. You know, yeah, this so can set people off. It's like, what? Why is it? Why is it? Why is it not working? Yeah. yeah. So you have to set the IP addresses properly. So even though he was on Promutter and he's going to be using Promutter for the rest of the tutorials, he but, also yeah. needs his personal laptop if he wants to use that Swagger page. 
So, but the instructions said both, right? Your yeah, private yeah, IP. Yeah, and yeah the instructions or, instructions were yeah, correct, but I was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I said, hmm, why do we really need UFEs? Oh, runs, and, and I was, I was, I thought we only need this for the command line bit, which we, which we scrapped from the tutorial. Uh, but yeah, I was, um, I was wrong. It was needed for the Swagger page. So, is okay. that an argument for extending the key length since you already have the two FAs of your IP address and the token? I, I that was yeah. a bit too <laughs> yeah. violent for me. I think like we're not the the Bjorn and I aren't the ones like well, no, really, yeah, 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 just yeah. the messengers. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah, we've cause I mean this is our complaints with it as well. Like we have the, the same type of things. We just have to work with security to get um that. And I think something of like so Steve talked about it earlier, we've been thinking about ways that we can have like a templated workflow or a templated job for you so that we can, if we can control a lot of what we know is happening and maybe you're only changing parameters for that job that we could go and let that have a lot longer of a lifetime um, and be able to give you tokens that have much longer lifetime because we know that they can only be used for one or two specific things. Right. Well, like well, this is, I mean, for, this is not really an argument for, you know, for, just because the credentials last long last long enough for today's tutorial session. No, it's only the access token that needs to be refreshed. Or did I get something wrong here? Okay, I made a new one. Just to give you some background, did you hear about the solar winds fiasco and all this other stuff? Yeah. Basically, the Russians owned every every network device. Oh, oh that, that yeah, one. Sorry. And so after that, the White House came out with this sort of like 50,000 foot security directive on how everything needs to be really, really secure. Right. Yeah. So but, but, but that works with two FA, like two, you need to two factors. Yeah. Like yeah. IP is, is a factor. Yeah. yeah. Depends on how big of a IP range you open it up to. And things sure, like but that you too, do but. it to one computer. Yeah. And that is the device. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I updated the token and added my IP and now it works. <laughs> okay. So if you if you have the same issue, please add your IP to the uh, please please adhere to the um to the script and not me who just did not and got burned by it. Yeah, adhere to the script and it should work. Um so you can you can now see, you know, you can you can get responses right through the swagger user interface. So, okay, so now, um, now it's time for you to play a bit with this. Um, okay. This, yeah. Uh, you should try the Swagger UI without token. Just take a look at the status, for example. I skipped over this uh, this time, but you know, take a look at the status endpoints. I think those are the most useful ones. Uh, you know, use it with a red one or green yellow token um, to see that you know, some of these endpoints you don't have access to, and some you you might. Um, actually, every endpoint in the description it will tell you it will tell you scope like red, green, yellow, red. So it, in in the Swagger UI, if you take a look at the the scope bit in the description of the endpoint, it will tell you if it requires a red token um, or a green or a yellow ones. Um, yeah. So if you want to go, um, go in and use the use the API to find a location in one of your projects. Uh, find out which groups you're in, find out your user ID. I did it just, you know, I just demonstrate that, you know, look at planned or past outages. And you could also do like a simple command, like for example, hostname, right? Or LS. Now you just hit this, put this one in and, and um, then we'll get a task back and then you can query that over the task endpoint. I think this is a bit more an advanced bit. Um, so, you know, you can leave that out. Maybe a bit short on time. Um, so just maybe just do the first four and take a look at it. Just play with it for now. And then uh, if there's any trouble, Nick can help you in the room. 
and I can have the online because at this point it's just a bit it's a bit less uh gets a bit more trickier than before before it was just cookie just cookie cutter exercises um Okay, I'll leave you to it. If we have a, a natural break at 10.30, I was told that we can have some people there earlier if we want to. Yeah, so I think maybe this might be a good time. We can just take a little bit extra time right now and take a break. Yeah. Um, so take a break, do this. Uh, if you're in the room here, we can go down and grab coffee or something like that. Um, yeah, and, and, yeah, and then we and just maybe resume a bit earlier instead. So we shift the break forwards 50 minutes for okay. you to play, get coffee, get stuff, um, you know, harass Nick with questions. No. Um, yeah, and then we, con we, we continue at 10.45, at which point we go through the demo notebook, which probably take just like 10 minutes. Um, and then uh, we go to the over to the client. Um, and if people if people want to, they can also use the demo notebook right away, right? If they if they don't want to wait for me, this essentially just goes through the blocks. Um, you can also do that if you want to. So since I'm lagging a bit, so yeah. So once we authorize ourselves to the Swagger API, then I guess the I mean authorized yourself then you want us through the ui try out the various commands yeah so yeah 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 you can it's us. basically just showing you so that you can the swagger api is is pretty nice because then you can see um it'll show you like uh the curl command that, that it's calling and then it will also show you like the output in json underneath um so it's kind of showing you this is the way that you would call the api with something like curl or however you want to call that, and then it shows you the output as well. So it's kind of just seeing how- Okay, but I don't see, I'm not seeing the curl option. The, it'll, when you, um, oh, when you do I guess execute you, one of the commands. So if I do, like, for example. Uh, try it out, yep. Okay. And then execute. And it shows you that curl command, and then it also shows oh, you the output awesome. of the, of the so it's, it's nice to, to be able to, see what the data model looks like, see how you would call that API endpoint. So are we at the break point now or? Yeah, we're at a break right now. So we'll take a break. Um, it's kind of like a working break. So if you want to go through the demo notebook, you can go through the demo notebook. Um, or I'll do yeah. this, you know. We, we're, yeah, gonna, in, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a quick run through the demo notebook after the break. And to give you as much time as possible for the API client, because it's the, the more evolved notebook. Um, let me see the job. Uh, scroll up. Oh, he has. And staff as the account, you're going to want to change that to, to my user. Um, you might be in the entering three, or if not, then one of your accounts. Um, so that, yeah, that account is going to be, uh, if you go up to CPU, <coughs> yeah, you're in entering three. So you can use entering three um, for the demos. So I'm getting forbidden when I'm trying to download the files. <laughs> is your what IP addresses did you put in? I put this one and the Perl letter. Okay. Is anyone online who needs uh who wants my assistance? I just replayed. you can go to a breakout. Um so and I can I can have you out. I have some feedback. <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead. I, who am I? Okay. Uh, this see. Is I actually um did the notebook all the way through to the job submission. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. And so I tried to submit the sample bash script and okay. it gave me an error, but 
it gave me the highly uninformative response unspecified error. Because <laughs> oh. uh, we capture more error message. <laughs> so, yeah, you way. probably, yeah, I think I think in my JavaScript, I use n staff. You might want to use n frame 3 instead. Yeah. yeah. So which yeah, I think you? it's an oversight. Can I, Apologies. Can I can yeah. Or something else? Yeah. I, I, I did. No, my, my user's fine. Anything with the locks? Um, so first, no, I mean, I mean, I'm authorized, right? So. Uh, yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is, anything with the lock would get would uh, you can try out. Let me just change that in the git in the git right away. Yeah, so just that in there. Oh, When did you you got a fresh token? Oh wait, I, what is mine for now? What? Yeah. We took it down. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible <Bring> people. Bring <laughs> How about some Russians? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> keep it all. <laughs> oh, crazy podcasts. I tried to get it. Just a list of running jobs. So, and see, it's sqcommand.com. Hmm. Why did that swagger API just not work? Okay, it might work again now. Um, I don't know what's happening. Okay, so you just have a new token and then re. Yeah, so I'd updated the the demo notebook on like GitHub. So if you want to download it again, it should have now the right account. Like that. Yeah, I use my M342 account, but it just oh, yeah, that works too. Thing. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So as a general thing, you want to give like more informative error messages. Okay, right? so that works. You know, you know that's a, that's that's the struggle we have with them um, all the time. Yeah, no, no, it's just using the, just yeah. The, the programmers don't want to do it, or is it hard to capture the error message? Sorry, it's a struggle just as a general thing because programmers don't bother capturing what the output. You use? Or it's hard to capture the error. Uh, so I created three it's the I, uh, I think when we discuss this with system scoot okay. sometimes not, not a red one. It's so it, the problem with with this slurm script is it's very difficult to capture what the user intended. So sometimes so, the error message is um it's just so unspecific because it's not quite clear what the user was doing wrong. Right? You for you for us it would be clear we are, we have a context the scheduler doesn't have the context, so the systems group uh, was uh, you know they made like, some good examples for that they can't really you know make these assumptions but right? but so it's better to have an error and specify than to give out the wrong advice um, to the user that's the that's the that's the narrative here. Swagger but I think at the end of the day, in the current implementation, it's just SSH swagger. overing someplace swagger. and swagger. then trying to do whatever. Right. Yeah, so it's not possible to capture that output and see what it says. Yeah. Yeah. I, have, I have trouble hearing you because yeah. the yeah. room is like, <laughs> yeah. it's okay. like one audience to me. Um, sorry. Okay. Could you, yeah. if you, I can, I can answer in chat if you want to come and chat. And just his oh so it's because if you go up you're trying to go on DTN oh for not for letter yeah there you go <laughs> yeah just like the deploy so, so then why is this token only for ten minutes because this is your like short lived bear token okay um so that's that's just the token that you're using to access those endpoints and the reason it's ten minutes is because this will let you do anything as that user. You need to go back and like re-authenticate with your actual token. Yeah. So the idea is if you were to accidentally leak oh. this by by like, let's say that you curl, but you don't have HTTPS, like, right? It's not right. encrypted. Right. Someone could grab that in the middle, but they're they're only gonna be able to grab that once and then use that for 10 minutes. So you're like 
It's well, the they can do a lot of damage. I know you can do a lot of damage in ten minutes, but it's not it's not like you've just leaked your entire private key. You've only leaked a key for that last. So 10 the minutes. bearer token we generated from the token notebook, right? And the time we can change, right? How long we want in the token notebook, right? or it's no, it's it's, it's always going to be ten minutes. So that's just the way that it's set up. Um, I mean, at that point. It, it's just, you're relying on the program to do it, just make it one time. You have a one time token to do one operation. I mean, always, we have to yeah, 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 I mean, you can do that on the programmatic level. Well, that's, well, that's what I'm saying, that you should, because in a tutorial session, 10 minutes is not long enough to do anything. You have well, to do that. it's not for a nine session, but you may, yeah. you may get something and you submit it, it fails, you have a transient failure, you want to try it again, that goes the whole rig and roll of trying to get another token. But for what it's worth, I was trying it, and my old token seemed to have expired, and it said getting a new token. So I think at least. Well, I was I was getting forbidden instead of keeping your token. So I'm confused. Okay, so I I, I, I saw a message that says fetching a new token. You only get so I thought maybe it was for ten for minutes. Right. Yeah, there's no way to change that. I don't think so. I would, um, I'm not capturing all the comments. So if you if you have something you wanna um say later about the API or something that needs improvement, it's super valuable for us. So yeah, if yeah. you can keep that in mind or maybe jot it down, and then when we ask for feedback uh later. Then you can just if you put it in, that would be super helpful for us. The keys I can I can see some I can hear some voices. Okay. You know. So depending on what color you get, it's the red the, one which the we create. red one's two days. So every two days we have to generate a new key yeah. and repopulate. So Steve's point is valid, right? Like yeah. there's no way in a running infrastructure. It, if so, so doing with it. <laughs> yeah, uh, with a security review, we can give you up to thirty days with that red token. Um, but that still can be can be hard. That's once so, a month that someone has to go in and go fiddle with keys and, and, and make sure you did that. That's what yeah. I'm struggling with. Thirty days. Someone has to Let's say if I were to manually click through everything, board something to and some jobs automatically. It's really not appropriate so for using the keys. Then I have no, to get better tokens. Yeah, to be honest, I, I prefer that. So for ten minutes, I'd rather do it So. This is kind or of like the play demo to show you how you the Swagger API works, and, then, and so and, and like all the components that are coming in. That's fine, you know. After the break, I'll go over our client library, the library you know, which is the Python library that does all this work. Goes <laughs> so man, like it's kind of magic. You just give it. Here's the JSON. Here's the here's the client. Here's, like, here's, a client ID, here's the, the JSON file. Want, like, okay. Makes a client, and you can use all of this. It out that you want, fine. and it will automatically okay. refresh tokens. It automatically does, does, does a program. refresh of the bearer token. You, you, it does refresh of bearer token. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I can give you one time that you can run it by AC. On my automatic. It's a Python library, so you can build whatever you want. An SH proxy for you. Okay. And then programmatically fetch you new client. Yeah. I think that these are like more of. But of course, I want to show people. No, no, I think the structure is perfect. Yeah. We've done this all over. Oh, yeah. No, I think you guys have all our tokens. Have a deal down like this way. It's good for the basics. Okay. It's just that I'm not going to be. You're trying to be figuring out what's going on. You can't. It's just the iris portion that is. And then it does your client give. Because you have to offer a synchronous way yeah. on you drive, drive some machine. I think you press like a Selenium in or something like that. The client is written that. I think it's just uh, uh, asynchronous. Iris is just resting. Like with async, so a wait, and in Python. Um, um, and then we actually get your have a client ID step in our build that we strip out. Of that. So we have the client is available. Um, asynchronous and synchronous. So you can use either one. Yeah, that's true. We just sort of like snippets. When you submit jobs, everything's asynchronous anyway. So you submit a job, you're given back a job ID, and then you just have to get a job ID. So do back in the day. No, 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 you might as well do that as well. No, it says with the other one. So I'm thinking that I found that, like Amazon did was. So you know you, you have, have to get some jobs. The one, yeah. Is they are always async. And so I. And then in in the past, AWS is in the past for programmatic log. log. Um, so you could associate a log event string. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if they've been the events up there. So let's say like. And I don't know if the MFA like hack jobs, right? has access. I to just associated the same log event stream, and then in my logic of whether the what's updating the state of the jobs that I am receiving, like I'm interested in. All I needed to do is fetch the new data from the log stream. Okay, yeah. 
from that street. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was indeed really pretty elegant because that prevents you from doing like busy polling all the time. Yeah. And trying to get the status of your jobs. And at the same time, it's a clean interface. You just are looking for one log file where you know all the jobs that you're interested in. Or the events will come. Well, come there. I don't know if we'll be able to do that. The, yeah, the other thought I'm, that it, yeah, the other thought that I always have too is whether we could put callback events so that you could instead give a callback and let the API side report report back to something when something when an event happens. Um, but yeah, just because we have to like we have to deal with Slurm as the scheduler in the back end and. And if you have multiple machines and things like that, it's going to be hard to. Also, you know, way back in the day, four or five years back, I, I had seen some DOE effort of having a common API across the DOE clusters. Is this super facility API a result of that or it's different? Uh, we're hoping that this becomes, this model becomes the model that we use everywhere. So we're talking with other labs. Um, so we're talking with Oak Ridge uh, and Argon uh, right now, at least about how do we have something that's common between them. So the API might not be the same, but the interfaces should all be the same. And this is and we, 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 are, we are starting with like status and stuff. Uh, Newt. Newt. Newt yes, Newt is, Newt is uh, going to be retired very soon. Um, the son of Newt. Yeah. <laughs> The new distant prominent on the nurse documentation. Yes, it is. <laughs> I must say that you guys have a tendency to lead people to a rabbit hole on that front. <laughs> yeah, we need to go. We, we had a cleanup of all of the uh, Corey documentation, and I still, every once in a while, find references to Corey on there. So I found one the other week. Yeah. Last week. <laughs> yeah. But you, yeah, still I think like the difference stuff. between Newt and this when is like, Newt didn't stuff. have the token stuff figured out. Right. It was a. I. I didn't even like. I saw some of it, but I never got to the point of actually like using Newt because the tokens confused me too much. Okay. Yeah. So Newt is Newt also is also built with a lot of craft. In. It's a lot of yeah. self self uh, stuff written not really to standards. You know, it's this this uses the API uses standard tooling. It's like you know we try to look look for That's best practices, good. not just like make an API. You know. <laughs> So. so you're saying that Argon and Oak Ridge, you're in conversations about, about a potential SF API, but not this, the same interface, but not the same API? So, no, so, yeah, so, so the, the back end might be different. Okay. But all of the, the like, so what we have here like on the swagger. Like the swagger, like accounts projects should okay. be the same. The JSON that you get back should be the same. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have to, sorry, I have to, Nick, I have to kind of um, stop you. Right there. We are just in very preliminary stages. Yeah, Every yeah. HPC center has their own flavors. We're just starting to that we have a we have we're working on a common yeah. API, but we're kind of restricting us to um, something that's less that doesn't require authentication. So we're working with status first. Um, but yeah, that we, we're meeting regularly and and you know a, using APIs uh, is a new thing for many HPC centers. I always think SSH. First, so it's a slow process, and you know the people have to adjust the security stance for this too. So uh, it's it's a long it's a very long uh, process. So I would not say, you know, in the end every facility will have exactly this API. We might not. We might there there will might be there might be some changes on the way yeah. as we well, as we engage in this the, discussion. I thought that was the premise of the IRI work, so that. So exactly. You know, exactly. Maybe we start I will again. fund you to make this stuff uh, similar. Ten forty-five, I think. Ten forty-five. Yeah, yeah. We that's. I mean, that would be so cool if if you know people under our eye could get there, could agree on like one one uh, API. Okay. The 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 cool the benefit is that we we have we and CSCS are a bit further out, and many other centers acknowledge it's just not worth it to for them to just re-engineer or, or redefine all these interfaces so just gonna say we might just go ahead and copy as much as we can so that's good because then you know with this with like having established some form of leadership across apis it's easier for other facilities to kind of say okay well we see it's useful we just hop on instead of 
developing our own flavor. Um, but yes, yeah, so also um, the uh, the way to get a token might just be different at other facilities. We, I think if you ever gonna start from having one API layer that also has authorized endpoints, it'd always be just, you, you put in a token, some form of token, the token has to be minted you know, by the facility, well, I'm, I'm, I, in my, my, uh, my wish list would be that there would be centralized OIDC uh, service where you can mint your uh, access tokens accepted by all the APIs and all facilities. That would be so great if that came out of IRI. But I'm, I'm not sure we get, we're gonna get this. But yeah, but yeah, ideally, you know, you want to have as many similarities between the APIs as, as possible, or at least have like the very. Um, a common uh, like the, a small base set of endpoints that are available everywhere, so that the AP, that the a, a, HPC a, the APIs at the different APC HPC does only differ, you know, in small uh, details. Yeah, or have like a little a few more extra endpoints, yeah. for example. Yeah. For what it's worth, um, my team is also working with uh, the Emson team over at PNNL to try and get an API up there for their batch scheduler. And they've mm -hmm. already got Tiller and Resty running internally. And um, so they will probably just bring up Slurm Resty. Seems like everyone just uses Slurm anyway. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, so Slurm has kind of emerged as the dominant scheduler. Yeah. So if you just have something that just almost directly maps on the Slurm REST API, that's the easiest way. Mm -hmm. to yeah, but I think we're, we still have to go through the super facility API in a sense to give you access and for external yeah. access. <laughs> I mean, the Slurm, agree, but yeah. This, you know, here's the whole, here's the tree yeah. for SF API and so this branch is, of it is just basically a proxy. That's 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 actually what would have to happen, yeah. 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 But the I mean the REST API from Slurm doesn't doesn't know anything about authorization. Doesn't doesn't have this bit. So you always have to provide some wrapper on the outside to make it available outside of the center. Yep. Yeah. And that's why you come into SF API endpoint. Yeah, you're going to take care of all that stuff. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. We we are actually we are looking into this internally too to have like the Slurm respite coming in, you know, and then you don't, and kind of not having to, ha internally having to SSH into the system and execute Slurm commands, and that, which is what we're currently doing. It will be just, okay, this is FPPI. We, after the authorization, you know, with the users, we just go directly into this, into the Slurm rest bit, you know, and then do it, do what we want to do, or then the backend does what it wants to do. What it's been asked to do. Sorry, <laughs> so that's 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 it. That's ideal world, right? Yeah. I have a question about Globus transfers. Yes. Do those run? So yeah, I saw the other thing in the chat that says that it's just basically SSHs onto a node and executes a command. That's for its command and um, that's for the jobs endpoint on in command endpoint. It does SSH. Okay, when you so when you do a Globus transfer and use that endpoint, is it just does it SSH onto a data transfer node and use nope. whatever? Yeah, the, no, the 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 trans so the transfers are only internally. Now, it worked before with with Corey, there were we also had it working externally with external transfers, and I'm not quite sure if I know the implications now why that is so, the part is broken. Uh, uh, you... It's it's broken because of the way that the new Globus is working, um, and I'll probably be working on a a fix because that endpoint's a little a little strange as well because it also just does an SSH onto. Uh, Perlmutter and then runs our transfer files uh, script, um, but it needs to be updated a little bit to work with uh, to work with the new version of Globus. Um, okay. Yeah, and the SDK. So yeah, this one the 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 storage the the transfer endpoints a bit wonky currently. I would not recommend building okay. on that. And the and the point is also Globus has a 
we, we and facilitate Globus and Globus has a fantastic API. There's no way around, we, we, we're talking with Globus, but there's no way around authenticating with, with Globus yourself. So currently we can't just, you know, we thought like what if Globus just accept our tokens, you know, and, and gives the tokens to the other facility and they accept our tokens because they trust us and they like us you now. What if, to... but Globus didn't agree to do this. So you will still have, so even if we, if, even if we go and do all this, it will still have to be ex additional steps to, you know, register with, 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 the, with the Globus and activate the endpoints, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, I'm, it's kind of, if you want to do, just use the API. Yes, use the API. Yeah, and and build like and you and use it. You just use two APIs in your script. Essentially, use the Globus API for the transfer. Use it as an OI API for things you want to do at Nurse. You know, in an ideal world, you know, you wouldn't need need this, but currently that's that's. Well, Caesar's probably a good good question. Why can't we use Globus to authenticate us? No, I'm serious. Like, I mean, I mean, use the Globus token to 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 generate this this ten minute token. Yeah, I'm. Let me so, let me put a pin in that. I was there was there was a reason why this cannot cannot happen. So I think uh, this is probably something that I'm I'm in charge of uh, handling Globus at this point, <laughs> um, and so this might be something that we could do soon. Our current off method with. Globus is uh, fairly old. Uh, we're trying to update it so that it will be in line with the like the OIDC that we use for everything. And so hopefully, if we can transition over to that with Globus, then it's the same login that you have everywhere. Um, so it would look the same as like logging into Jupyter or into Iris or anything like that. Um, and with that, we might be able to to do something better because then it's going to be just the same. The same token, but we'd have to work with um, the infrastructure group here, who handles like the API backend and everything to see. I mean, there's also like token lifetimes. This is the same. You know, what about the, this? Is more. This is also like the the security aspect of our tokens. Yeah, that were yeah. these these times were selected after a certain security review. This ha it has to whatever. If you go, if you authenticate through Globus, whatever we get from Globus, you have to kind of we have to kind of keep that same. Um, security posture here. It yeah, can't be that. If Globus already has a couple of days uh, that they can write to a file system, then they have as much access as. Well, they can write to file system that they can't execute or arbitrary commands. Yeah. So that's going to be the security counter, right? Yeah. So the only thing that Globus runs is grid FTP copies. And so because of that, you can say, okay, we know they're only running one command ever. Yeah, and right. so they they're allowed to run it. They could put up to be bin batch, right? And then <laughs> yeah, they could show the force. Yes. For what it's worth. Anyway, it's not it's it's nothing. It's something we we we're, we're entertaining. But it's not we're not we're not quite. Yeah, it's all like it's different avenues we want to explore, but it hasn't come to like this point where we said okay. Like, so this this all works together. All the interests are aligned. Again, something that could come of IRI. The other option is that we're not using Globus for transfers and uses a different tool where we have a bit more control over, like an open source tool more for the transfers. What tool are you guys considering is to go Globus for transfers? I don't think we have anything else in mind at the moment. They're just thinking in general about. No, it's, yeah. So, so we're setting up um, an extra D service uh, as well to let like collaborations use extra D uh, back and forth. Um, so that could be an option as well. So over DGI, uh, they brought up the key cloak server and apparently key cloak will talk to everything. Okay. And so you can get programmatic tokens out of it. It seems, I don't know if they have it tied into NFA, but you may want to look at that and say you could engage George yeah. about it. So if you engage George, you may get trapped in a George debate. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I've got a, I have a meeting. Yeah. I'll be back at the end. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Sorry to be troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, every, every all this information is useful. Um, okay, so we're, we're at the point, every, well, it's 
now, so... Yeah, it's 10.45. We could probably start up again. Um... Okay, let me... Um... I think... I think the only thing we do was going to the demo notebook now, and then it's time for the client library. So let me see if the demo notebook works. <laughs> okay. Another another case is like anyone. If we can also ask the audience and skip this bit. Does any as anyone? Um, does, does, does anyone want to see the demo notebook? Yeah, yeah, yeah we, can, okay. we can go through it. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Okay, so here, um, what we did in this demo notebook, it kind of stems from some old um, demos we made for supercomputing. So, you know, the client is like the, it's like the better way of, of interacting with it. But if you think about, oh, I don't want to be dependent on another library again and do everything myself, which some people do prefer, this is like kind of a way to, to see how you can like do a minimal implementation of uh of some Python tools to interact with um, the uh, the API. Okay, so um, what you will see here is um, it's an interactive demo of a non-interactive work or something that should run in automated fashion, but um, it's. Um, I see we're just going to take a look and inspect each of the blocks and see what's happening there. Um, the highlight here is uh, the asynchronous nature and that we are polling uh, the task to see what's going on. So we import a bunch of uh, standard libraries in the beginning. Um, so I, I wrote like a few like, stupid um, classes here to the one that represents the task. And one that is just a function to hit the API. Uh, and here you can also see that I, I use the, the expires at uh, to figure out uh, if you need a fetch to new, new token or can keep the old one here. But here what it really does is it try, it checks, it, it goes to the task endpoint in the tasks class. And uh, you know if it's not completed, it will query and we'll see that as we go uh, through the night, since we don't have much time to go through each and every uh, bit of the uh, class, but we see that it will go and we'll hit the task endpoint and see what the what the status is. Okay, so let's let's get going and cross our fingers that everything worked. I already saw in the comments that it, it worked for for some. Okay, so my key, I said it was red. Here, now I set to adjust the, the client ID. Okay. So this is the same from the token notebook. Okay, see, so we can successfully fetch an access token. So now we're going kind of through the, through the model case. You know, the first one is to check. If systems up, this doesn't require our access token. Um, so we see parameter, parameter is active, hooray. Uh, so that 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 is just great. So we, now we can execute jobs on, on parameter. We can also ask for other services, for example, uh, data transfer nodes are online, community file systems online, globes is online. Um, and then the next bit is like, if you want to plan, you know, um, your, your workflow, you might want to see, you know, can I submit the same job tomorrow? Is this aligned with the FL beam plan tomorrow? Will the, uh, will nurse be up for this? So you can 
go to plant outages, yes, status outages plant parameter. And here you see that uh, tomorrow we have actually scheduled maintenance uh, from six in the morning to 10 in the evening. And the entire system will be uh, unavailable, you know, pending <clears throat> updates, of course. But yeah, here you can see you can if you want if you want to you know include planning in your workflow, you can you can use this endpoint. So now we will do um, we create a, a job script. I used uh, here and stuff, but the the um, the doc the training material on GitHub will use and train so that I updated that part. Um, but for for now it doesn't matter. So which is for I don't want to change it here now. Um, so, um, here we create a, a job script and then we, we save it. So we use the cut command. So the, the command endpoint and cut to use the, the, the job script to create as a string and to put it down as an actual, uh, file on the, on Pomodoro. And here it is. So this is the, the bash script. We created that we want to submit. You know, I think for you, if you want to build uh, some pipeline, you probably have some templated job script that you're running. So this is just, you know, uh, here just an exercise to use the command endpoint. Oh, yeah. Go away. So if your okay. bearer token expires while your job is still running, which you submitted using the bearer token, there's no side effect, right? Like the job yeah, is still the jobs, Yeah, right? it's it's completely asynchronous from each yeah. other. Um, so yeah. you just have to get another bearer token to be able to get the job information back. Yeah. Okay, what you also see is here that it pulled seven times, because it command is an asynchronous endpoint, it pulled seven times, you know, until it, uh, until that command is executed. Um, the LS utility is instantaneous, not it's not asynchronous, so it will come back right away. Here you see that we created. I showed you before, but you know, if, you know, if you if you are um, some kind of if you build like a workflow tool, you don't have this interactive capacity of a web browser, so you might want to check it uh, with LS if you if the file you create is actually there. Now we submit uh, to the job queue. So it does this the first bit uh, we will just pull and it comes back with completed. But that actually means doesn't mean that the job has actually executed, only means that Permoda that the slip the scheduler has accepted the job. So the, the job submission will is is a, is an asynchronous, is has been made asynchronous and will come back with Slurm has accepted your job or Slurm has uh, uh, not accepted your job, at which point you will see the error. <laughs> In this uh, in this error box here, but now we now uh, what you see here is that it's it's completed and the result contains the job ID, and now you can use that job ID to uh, to query um, the status of the job. And because of talks, you know, it should probably have ex executed already. I oh, know it's still pending, and that is uh, so submit to the regular queue, no debug. Okay, so we can do this a couple of times. Of course, if you do this in, like, in the demo, it will always come back with pending. Um, but the only thing that will change is it will go to running or completed. You know, if you do the job, if you do the demo script yourself. Um, Actually, it's kind of cool that it's impending because now you can actually just hit it over and over again to see. Uh, oh, no, it's running. Yay, it's running. So should be able to actually execute so super fast. Um, yeah, and in the job script, we only ask for the host name, I believe. Uh, host name and then we sleep 20 seconds and uh we also print finished right should come for 20 seconds still running Let's give it a few more seconds because here we're just tailing uh the output file 
this command. This hits the command endpoint, so it's asynchronous, so it pulls. And when it comes back, so the, the aqua file has only the host name entry written in it. Come on. Okay, um, I'll finish. And that and it should say here completed now. Completed. Okay. So here you see, um, I think what the takeaway from this uh from this no from this exercise is that the endpoints come back right away and that you use this and what it does, I mean it hits this task endpoint or the task endpoint all the time to get uh, to get the information out. And so your the, the API calls are short are short and asynchronous and you have to you have to do this like over and over again. But the cool thing is that you that you are whatever app you build on it will not store at any point. So it will just it will come back with you all the time. So that's how, how the API is being um, conceived. Okay, I think that's everything. Uh, and I'll hand over to Nick who will show you the client library. I hope this has been useful. I will craft a survey and paste it into the Zoom chat. And and then I will also share it with whoever is on the uh, invite, on the calendar invite later. Um, so yeah. Okay, let me share. Okay, um, so yeah, so now I'm going to go over a little bit about um, a, a client library that we built in Python to interact with the API. So we saw kind of the nuts and bolts of how you actually would go and interact with the API directly. Um, the reason the API is written in a way, it's a REST API, so it can be used by like any programming language. Um, we do our demo in Python and we wrote the um, client library in Python because we see a lot of our users using Python as their uh, productivity language, so it makes sense, but you can also use it from a whole bunch of different languages. Um, so the SF API client library is a Pythonic way to interact with the API. Um, and so we use uh, the models that we actually get from Swagger to automatically generate a lot of our uh, our code using Pydantic, which is a way to pull in from a Swagger uh, API and then change that into Python classes. Um, and it's built to be both an asynchronous and synchronous client. Um, so this allows us to have, uh, for our power users who know how to use and write asynchronous Python code, um, they can write asynchronous Python code and use the client library in order to go and uh, maybe make a web app or something that's a little bit more responsive. Um, but then having it synchronous as well uh, allows for a really easy uh, barrier entry into um, getting everything up and running. Uh, so we have some information. Um, so all the codes up on GitHub uh, at GitHub NERSC and then SF API underscore client. Um, we have an automatic documentation page that comes from there as well. So all of the doc strings get automatically put onto this uh, documentation page. Um, and then I just created yesterday, but a, uh, if you have any more questions afterwards, or if you decide that you're going to start using the, the client library, um, on our nurse user Slack, I just created a channel called SF API client. And so if you have more questions, if you start using it and you, you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out there or come to help.nurse.gov um, and talk about the SF API client. Let us know and it should get to the right people. So um, we're gonna be using this. Uh, so in the notebooks folder, there's a directory called SF API client. And then we'll go to, we're gonna be using the SF API client demo notebook. Um, so you'll need to have, uh, let's see where we put it. Yep, 
you'll need to install the uh, client library. So I'm gonna oh I'm gonna make sure that we uh, um, we're gonna use version 0.0.6. Um, so uh, if you're on Perlmutter or on your own laptop, wherever you wanna run these demos, um, you can create a Conda environment and then we'll activate the Conda environment and then install a few packages there. Um, so if you have the slides open, this is on page seven of the slides. Um, and then we can uh, use that to start going along with the tutorials. Um, so I don't know how long. So I'm just checking in the room too. So everyone's kind of getting the everything installed and then we'll make sure, we'll just wait a second for everyone to get things installed and then we can start, uh, start running stuff. The main thing is that we need to install the um, client library. Uh, you're back. Make it all the way to IGP and then see my meeting <laughs> So this we are doing on our own laptop, so you want to so yeah, so you log can, in nodes. So you can do this on your own laptop as well. So if you have um, Python installed on your own laptop, I think that's a this is a good, uh, like especially if you have the client already made and it's on your laptop, this is good to show that it works other places, right? It doesn't just work from running it from Perlmutter on, a, on Jupyter, it works from everywhere. Um, so I will personally be running it from, uh, from my laptop. Yeah. Do we have access to these slides? Um, if you're if you're part of the if you were on the invite, they're included on the invite. Um, let me see if they're on. I can paste them. I can paste them in. Yeah, not everyone's on the Zoom either. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you can't register anymore. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I can. I can open it again, but I I I, I blocked it because I. We want to need to, at some point need to stop to add people to the project. I don't think it'll add people automatically to get the to get the slides at this point. Uh, what's the best way to yeah. share the slides? Share and like you can enter his email and you can Yeah, what's your uh, what's your email? Oh uh, it's this. Should I tell you? Yeah, you can. Can I get on there too? Yeah, I'll get you on there. Yeah, so what invite are you referring to? Is if you signed up for the training, it should have given you like a calendar invite. And then on that calendar invite, um, yeah, that's good. Oh, there's a way to sign up specifically for, the training. for this training. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Does there anyone actually sign up for the training? <laughs> <laughs> I registered for the whole week, but I didn't know there was specific. Yeah, I realized it last night, but the thing was closed. Yeah. Just S Y Chan. Yeah, that, yeah. Anyone else? Do you wanna just make it viewer, please, not editor. Oh. <laughs> or commenter. Commenter is also fine if you want to comment. That's great. You want to comment on? <laughs> uh... Let me add the feedback form to the slides. If it all in one place. Yeah, that works too. So, you know, I think one suggestion which I have because when we do our training and we also do Google Slides, we always create a tiny URL. 
for the conference. Yeah. So that way it's easier to share Google slide links. Yeah, I should have had everyone do this during the break. I'll remember that for next time. <laughs> Does everyone have the slides that can copy and paste on their own? Anyone online still working? Any thumbs up? Good. Hey, um, just had a quick question about eSync. Yeah. Um, if is this one of those libraries that uses async IO where you have to? I remember like there there are a few libraries I've used where you have to patch something in the Jupyter notebook one time every time when you load your notebook in order to use yeah. it. So, so if you use this asynchronously, asynchronously in a Jupyter notebook, it does work. Um, okay. So, it, right. so I don't know if it's that Jupyter has been updated um, to work with it better. Um, I I went with the I can I'll, I'll change one of my um, uh, one of my demo slides to show it as asynchronously. I put it as synchronous at the moment, but I'll I'll show that it works in the notebook as asynchronous as well. Okay, sweet. Thanks. <laughs> I think there was, for some reason, the last uh, command, the copy paste did not work. I think the new line. Oh, uh, the new line kind of messed it up. Yeah. Yeah, I think in the future as well, um, especially for the demo, we'll, we'll need to work with the people who maintain the. Um, our NERSC Python, and we'll probably just get the super facility client baked into the into that, so we don't have to do no one has to install anything. Okay, I think we're pretty close. Um, I'm going to start going through uh, the demo, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to like interrupt me and stop me uh, anytime during the demo. Um, Okay, let's move that <clears throat> All right, so um, this is just the demo for the SF API client. So um, at the top, I'm just importing um, from our client library um, a few different things at the moment. So the first thing, we're going to import the client uh, class. Um, and then inside of our client library, we also have some uh, different submodules, and all of those should be similar to the uh, endpoints that you'll see on that Swagger documentation. So for here, um, I'm looking at the compute endpoint or the compute module as part of the client library and importing the machine. Um, so this will give us a, a list of machines that are available at the moment. Um, then at the bottom here, I have um, Pathlib, which is just going to be used to, to get some paths on our local machine, um, and then the JSON web key and JSON uh, to handle those tokens, um, loading all those in. So the first part of this is going to be setting up uh, our keys and getting some information about ourselves um, and what the, the client sees us as. So I've stored my key in the .super facility folder as a JSON file. Did you load this? Uh, this is under um, this SF API client demo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, and then there's the SF API client demo. Sorry. Here. Yep. No worries. Um, so this is sitting on uh, my laptop here. Um, I saved it as SF API training.json. Um, 
but you can change this to, to wherever you stored your key. Um, you're going to want to use your red key for this because we are going to be submitting jobs towards the end and running a couple commands. Um, so it would be good if you use your red key. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and load in our key information. Um, so this is going to be very similar to what Bjorn did in his notebook. Um, I have my client ID. Um, I'm putting the path to my super facility key uh, and then reading it in and going to save it as this client secret. So we'll have our client ID and our client secret uh, saved. And so with that, we can put that into our um, client class and get back the client object and use that to see some information about ourselves. Um, so this right here, is just querying the um, accounts endpoint to see user information. Um, so here, uh, this line here, we're using our authenticated client to get information about the user um, that that client, that the key thinks that it is. Um, and here we can see that it's me um, and gives information. This is all just information basically from Iris Holden. Something to notice about this is that what you're given back is a user class. So this is a Python class that is specific for um, this, uh, for the user. So all of the objects that you're getting back from the client are essentially the JSON that came from uh, the web interface, from the, the REST API and uh, convert it into a Python class so that you can go and access a lot of its members uh, more easily. So like I was saying, you can access just a specific uh, member from this. So for instance, if I want to find my username, um, I can do user.name uh, and get the username back uh, for that. We also have a way uh, to then deserialize this back or serialize this back into a dictionary. Um, so this could be helpful if you want to log information or something like that. Um, you can go back into the dictionary form. The one extra thing that you're gonna get in this and you'll see kind of everywhere is this extra client. Um, so this is actually the client, uh, um, our client is being put back in uh, as part of the dictionary um, because it's part of its class. Um, and then we're going to need uh, a couple of useful variables as we go along. Um, all of our systems here uh, essentially use the same convention to get from your username to your home directory, your scratch directory, etc. So that's usually going to be your, uh, it's global homes, the first letter of your username, and then uh, your username. And the same thing with pscratch, it's going to be the first letter of your username, and then your username. So because we have our username that we got from the, the client library, we should be able to automatically populate those. So I just put in that uh, my username, first letter, and my username. And the same thing for pscratch to get both of those. Um, so we'll be using those later um, to automatically populate um, some of our, our job scripts. So here I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to, to try some stuff on your own. Um, so here we're gonna look at some of the things that we can get from the projects endpoint. Um, so the way that this works, a user has projects associated with them. Um, so first you would get your user information. And then from that, we can get projects uh, from that user object. Um, so if we look into the user object, we should be able to see projects come out.
So yeah, I'll have you fill this in yourself. So here uh, we've taken our user object and called the uh, projects function on it and gotten our projects object back. Again, this project object is going to be uh, a class with all the information in it. Actually, it's going to be a list of classes. Um, because most people should have more than one project, it's actually a list of classes. And so each one of these is a project object inside that. And so here I'm just looping through that list uh, and printing out all of the projects. So we can see here, there's a lot of information through here, but there's some helpful information as well in here. So let's say that you're using this in some kind of pipeline and you might wanna go check how many hours do you have left uh, in your account before trying to submit a job. Um, so in the projects, you can select uh, or we can go and print out the uh, things like the project hours used. Uh, and the total hours given. So we can see, again, we have our project's information. You can go and check things. Um, so we can see the projects that I'm in. We can see the hours that uh, we've already used in those projects, the hours that are given. So this is a great way to be able to go before you're submitting your jobs, check on things. Uh, maybe you want to check on your storage. Maybe your job's failing um, and you want to have some, some redundancy and some checks. You could go back and check why is my job failing? It could be because of a quota issue. It could be because of an hours issue. Okay. Just a quick, is everyone following in the room? Everyone following online? Good. Everyone gotten to, to see some stuff? Great, see some thumbs up. So we've gotten a little bit of information um, from that, but next we're gonna go through um, more of checking Perlmutter's queues, checking its status. This could be also helpful in your pipelines. You wanna make sure um, before you start running a job that Perlmutter's even up. Uh, maybe it went into unscheduled maintenance and you didn't know. You wanna make sure that all of your, uh, all the things that we have up. Um, and I'll change this as well. real quick. Okay. So here, um, I'm actually changing over this, just this one uh, to show that it also has, we also have a, an asynchronous client. Um, so the way that this works uh, is that you can add these async and await um, parts to your call. And this will allow you to uh, interact with the API in an asynchronous way. Um, and again, like I, like I was saying, it works in the notebooks um, now, so. So great, we get, um, we're calling our client um, and we're using the compute endpoint to look for information about the machine Perlmutter. Um, so this machine object is uh, an enumeration of all the systems that we have. Um, and so we're just giving it this to go see what the status uh, is of, of Perlmutter. Um, 
We can also do stuff, um, so to find information about other resources, um, there is a client.resources status. So this will give you uh, resources, any of the resources that we have. Um, so by running this, we'll see it's gone through and gotten all of the items um, from the status. Um, and then I'm printing out uh, the name of that system, uh, the status description of whether it's uh, of what's happening at the moment. So everything is active at the moment. So everything just says system is active. Um, and then just our, our regular status of that would either be um, active or um, maintenance or something like that. So everything is active right now, um, but this could be helpful if you have a service that you're dependent on, you can go and check the status, make sure that you have that active before you start trying to run something. Um, so next we'll go through kind of to look at um, another thing that could be helpful. So doing the same thing to go get the status, we can also get the outages. So this is the same thing Bjorn was kind of showing um, to see the outages of, of systems. Um, and uh, so we'll go through, we can go through here. Um, so I'll go through, I'm going to use my client. Uh, and we can do resources, outages. We'll get back all of the outages. And we can look at just the uh, top outage for, um, for it. So what we get back is a, the status comes back with a dictionary of all of our, um, everything that's in uh in our statuses and so i'm just looking at the next time so that the one up at the top um for parameter outage and we'll see that um, we have our name and then we have the, the date uh stored as a date time object that you could get back um, and look and we can see that it it will be tomorrow at 6 a.m which i kind of did this So that just printed out all of the outages. There's a lot in there. So we probably want to do more than just see if uh, Perlmutter is up or down. Um, so now let's look at some uh, information about jobs. Uh, so in the jobs, um, we're going to go and look at the jobs on Perlmutter. Um, so first we'll go get ourselves a compute object um, from Perlmutter. So that's uh, going to be client.compute and then for our machine Perlmutter. And then from our Perlmutter object, we can, be, we can do a lot of things. Um, so from Perlmutter, I'll get some job information. This is taking a little bit of time. So this is actually querying Slurm um, for all the jobs uh, in, the, in the GPU partition. Um, so it might take a little while. 
probably should have done a smaller, <laughs> uh, a smaller query. Um, for our, uh, for getting jobs back, um, when you interact with Slurm, there's two different ways that we can interact with Slurm, uh, or usually there's two ways that you interact with Slurm. One of those is SQ to see the current jobs that are in the queue. Um, the other one is the S account, S act, um, which is, will help you to see current jobs, but also jobs that have already finished. Um, and our, uh, we have two different, um, so from this object here, uh, we have both jobs and job. Um, job will get you back a single job, um, usually with something like S account. Um, and then jobs will get you back a list of jobs, usually from SQ. Uh, but, but we also have the ability to use uh, both of those um, for all of the, for everything. Do we still have the guideline that we're not supposed to run SQ frequently? Like we should use S account instead when possible. Um, yeah, so you don't want to run SQ like in a loop or anything like that. Um, and yeah, S account is sometimes better, especially if you know your job ID, then that's really helpful to use uh, to, to basically get a smaller query. The smaller a query that you can get, uh, you can kind of think about Slurm basically has a database on the back end. And so if you're thinking about that you're querying that database, if you're only looking for a single job ID or for your username, that helps that query uh, a lot more. There we go. So it's, I, I canceled that and instead went to just go, um, like I was saying, do a smaller query. Um, so here I just searched um, all the jobs with my username in them. Um, so that's one of the other options that we have. Um, this can be helpful. You can see all the jobs that you're currently running. Um, and again, you can see, I'll show you the first one. Um, so here we see two. Uh, it comes back with a list of jobs um, and it comes back, this is a job SQ class. So this called SQ on the back end, took all that information um, and now it's given us all that information back um, as, as members of this class. So you can go use that uh, for more information. Um, because we didn't get all the jobs. <laughs> um, I'm gonna skip over this. Um, I have a completed notebook as well. Because we didn't get all the jobs, because that was taking a little bit of time, um, this next one was basically to look through all the jobs. Because we have all the job information here, including things like um, the number of nodes that it's using, um, the number of CPUs, et cetera, uh, we could go through and 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 basically find search for uh, the the largest job. But yeah, uh, does that showing the jobs that are that is the like requested number of nodes, or that are actually utilizing that amount of nodes? Um, so the request and the use is always going to be the same. But yeah, so if you're in uh, if you run an SQ command, then you would get back the information about that job. Um, and it would have like the number of nodes um, that, are, that are running for it. And then you can see whether that job is pending, which means that it's waiting for those nodes to, to come available or it's running and it's actually running on those nodes. So yeah. And so yeah, so I'll show you two. So we also can go get um, the past jobs. So by default, um, the s account command will get us jobs uh, for about the last day um, that have been running. So again, we'll go look for uh, in our jobs. I'm gonna just look for 
my username and then And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to change instead of the default, um, which is SQ for, for this, I'm going to change the command to S account. Um, and we can see what we get back is now instead of getting uh, jobs from the queue, which is going to be the current pending or running jobs, um, we're now getting information about uh, past jobs, so jobs that have been that have happened in the past. Um, and it gives you a very similar uh, set of uh, information, except the S account actually gives you a little bit more because a lot of times you're using that for jobs that have already finished. Um, and so you have things like the total wall time, uh, the resources used, uh, and things like that. All right. Um, so the next thing we can do is we've looked at, we know how to get jobs back, but now we want to go and actually submit a job into the queue. Um, so here we're going to just do a little, we have a little test script here. Um, the job script starts uh, as normal. Um, if you're not in Ntrain 3, then you're going to have to change that account line, the minus A line, uh, to be into an account that you have access to. Um, but if you signed up, you should have been in Ntrain 3. And so here we're going to use uh, that the um, scratch path that I made before. Um, so I can go and make sure that my output files and my error files uh, are put into somewhere that I know. So I'm going to put them in my scratch directory in an SFAPI demo. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, uh, we're just going to generate some random numbers um, and print them out to the screen. So this will just be uh, a way that we can see that we did something on Perlmutter. So I'll run this. And here we just have the, uh, the generated thing. So just put in my um, scratch path automatically for me. Um, and then uh, put the size into our how many random numbers we wanted to, to generate. So Something you might also want to do is, right, I want to put this in my scratch SFAPI demo folder. But what happens if I don't have that folder on uh, Perlmutter yet? So what we can do is we can run commands using the, uh, from a compute object, we can do dot run uh, and then run that string. So this is going to be equal to the uh, command endpoint um, on the, the Swagger uh, API. Um, so in that, I'll go and do a make directory um, at scratch path uh, SFAPI demo. And then we can also do things like ls uh, on that to go uh, to see to make sure that we actually made that demo uh, directory. Um, and then see if it's there. Okay, great. So it ran that command, uh, the make directory command, um, and then did an ls to see that the directory was there. So something that's kind of cool is that we have, uh, if you're familiar with Python's um, pathlib, these uh, objects that come back are very similar to the pathlib objects, except they're kind of remote pathlib objects. Um, so it has a lot of the same features, such as is dir is file. Um, so you can kind of use these a little bit interchangeably with um, those, those. So we can go see, okay, we have our output directory, and it is a directory, um, which is really helpful. So now we can go use, 
um, the, the file that we just created um, and actually uh, submit a job. Um, so I'll do Submit job and then get that common job script. So here I'm going and um, using my compute object to submit a job. Um, and you'll notice something a little different than uh, what we did with Bjorn's demo. Bjorn went and, and uploaded his script to uh, the file system and then ran it. Um, this is really nice. So you can either do with the submit job, you can either do a path on uh, the file system, or you can just upload, uh, or you can just go and use a string. So in this case, we have a string that's just the, the job script, um, and it will, all, it will do everything kind of for you, which is really nice. Um, so this will go and take that, upload it, and submit it all to Sloan. Uh, and that will give you back a job object. So this job object that gets you back is going to be the same type of job object that we got back from the SQ command and the S account command. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just print that out. And job. So another thing that we're hiding with the submit job here as well is um, Bjorn did that constant pulling of the task ID uh, to get to get that. Um, but here we're kind of hiding a lot of that. So the idea is that this should be a lot a little bit easier to use. Um, you just have to think about submitting a job, uh, and then again, like I said, it comes back with a uh, with information, and this information is from um, uh, comes back as one of those job uh, objects. So, so internally, does the complete method on the job object call as account or as cute? Uh, job dot complete. Yeah. So job dot complete um, will call. Uh, How's remember. it pulling? Yeah, I don't remember what we're if we're using. I think we're using as account because it's just a single job. And we're just looking for that one job ID. Like 30, um, 30 seconds or something? Yeah, and you, so I th think we have it 10 seconds. Um, and there are also ways in there. So you can do timeouts for it as well. So you could say, uh, I don't want it to pull for two hours. I only want it to pull for 30 seconds. And if I don't get information back, you just give me an error. Um, so there are ways that to, to tweak that uh, in there. Yeah, I'll go through here. So, job of it. So, but, um, so this uh, is the submit job is the blocking call or the job dot state is the blocking call? Don't complete this. Yeah, so I'll show that here. Um, so here I'll print out the uh, job ID and then here if we call job dot uh, complete. So this job dot complete will wait for that job to complete before moving on. Um, does it check for error status or exit status? Yep. Yeah. So it'll check for it'll it'll it will return back once it gets to a final state. So whether that's an error, uh, finished. Uh, so or, how does it communicate error or good? Um, so you'll get back. Uh, the job is basically continually being updated in the background, and that job object will have the S account information in it. So then you could look at the S account information to see what the state of that job is. So yeah, so in here, what it's what that job.complete is really doing is every once in a while it's pulling back out, it's asking the super facility API, what's uh, go ask S account, what the information is. It's pulling that in 
and it's modifying the object, it's updating the object, and then that object will have all that information back in it. And then this isn't how that 10 minute token issue? No, so because what we're actually doing, um, we're storing that token for you, um, and then because it's a refresh token and because we know when it uh, ends, we will refresh the token if it needs to be refreshed before calling again. So in the, in the library? In the library. Refreshing already. Okay. Everything's already refreshed, everything's right. done for you, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the, the, we show you a little bit of the pain beforehand of if you wanted to do all of this by yourself, what you do, uh, and then we've written this kind of nice client so that you don't have to worry about it. Um, oh, I, I think it's just ID. It, is there an easy like job is good or job is failed or is there is it just you have to inspect the steps? Um. So you're saying, do we have a like? I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why Slurm rejects your job or it doesn't work or never schedules or like, you know, you need to, if you're monitoring the job, you need to account for all those situations. Right. Um, so it'll, it'll come back, it'll, so the complete will return from any terminal state. Uh, and then I think it's kind of up to you as the user to figure out what that terminal state means for it, right? So we can only, we're only really doing the, is it still pending, running, or is it in a terminal state? And then you have to decide from there, you know, if it was a node failure, maybe you just wanna retry it. If it's uh, something wrong with your script, then you might wanna handle that in a different way. It's job ID, by the way. Is it job.id or? Uh, it's job.jobid with no underscore. Ah, that's why I was okay. Thanks. Hey, quick question: When you submit the job and you're passing the body of the job script, where does that file actually get uploaded, and what directive is actually run? Does it try and find that from the directives in the job script, or how does that work? So this is this is just a so there are two ways um, in the API itself. So this isn't part of the um, uh, this isn't part of the client library directly. We do some checks for you uh, in the client library, but there are two ways in the compute inside of um, the Swagger. Uh, let's go to API. So here, um, if I get compute. post to a compute jobs machine and then is path says is true the job driver is a path and then if not, yeah. so basically uh if you give us a path um so the the client library is a little bit nice when you submit a job if you give us a path we'll actually check to make sure that you have the file there before we even try and submit the job um so if you say that this is a path here's the path on Perlmutter, we will check that and give you an error back before uh it even tries to submit the job or if we say is like if we give it a string, then we assume that um, that that string is uh, going to be the script itself, um, and so we set this is path to false, which means uh, the API will just go and take that string. Uh, it encodes it as your URL, sends it up as data, uh, and the API um, does that. The I think technically it gets saved on in temp somewhere. Um, the API will save it in temp somewhere, but it's it's not really saved in any any user location. Okay, so then if I like if there are files I need to get from that job afterwards, does that stick around for some time or? So if you want the job outputs and things, um, those I would recommend doing. So the script says put the job output in that folder inside Scratch job. Right. But you're saying if Python like makes some other file in the, in the directory, it's just somewhere in the temp directory. And so I guess you the, could get the location. The script, from so it actually, it'll, 
Um, so Slurm defaults to putting the output files in the directory that you submit from, and the API will submit from your home directory. So if okay. you don't put output in error, it will actually just put them automatically in your home directory, and it'll be like Slurm dash uh, job ID dot out. So that's the default for, for Slurm uh, is where the job ID is. Is there any way to, because I know in Slurm you can, like you can S control update the job to run in a certain directory. Is there any way to do that other than, or do you just have to save that in the batch file? Like, yeah, so, uh, so you could do that in like S batch. S batch has um, uh, like, a way to change working their directory. working directory there. Um, but yeah, everything that's submitted from the SF API gets submitted from your home directory. Um, okay. But yeah, there's a slurm, there's a slurm way to go and make sure that you can change directories and slurm will change the directory for you before submitting. Okay. Thanks. Okay, and then as we were waiting, um, so uh, we went and we waited for our job to finish, and then um, our job state turned into a complete. Um, uh, now we'll go uh, and use um, that job information. So. Now that we have a job ID, we have a job that we want to go look at, we can get information about that job um, later. So maybe you just have a list of jobs that you want to get information about. Um, you can use this to get a specific job as well. Uh, and this again, returns you back just a single job object um, that has all of this uh, S account information in it. So as part of the demo, we went and we had an output file uh, let's go get the path. Um, so the path should look like this. Uh, and so let's make sure that we have that file there. So we'll ls our path. And now here we can put our job ID. So good. So we'll check in that directory, um, ls for our output file. So I just took what that the slurm output file here. Um, with our scratch path, SFAPI demo, and then the job ID in there to get our output file. And so we have our output file. And again, this is a remote file per se, right? Mm -hmm. So I downloaded it. Um, it's a string IO object now. Um, so it's just a, a string that we can read. There you go. Um, so 
all it did was just make a whole bunch of random numbers in there. But we can see that we can go and use this. It's pretty simple to just go. Um, once you have an output file, you have something that you wanted to look at. Um, you can ls for that file that just makes sure that we have it there. Um, and again, this is one of those remote file paths. So we can go and make sure that the file's there. Um, you can go and look at things like the permissions on that file. Uh, but then we can also, because it's a remote file, we might want to download it. Um, so we can very easily download uh, small files this way, like log files, um, and get outputs. Okay, that's kind of the uh, the whole the whole walkthrough. So that goes through um, submitting a job um, and then getting some outputs from it. So um, happy to answer any more questions. Uh, back to submit the job. Yeah. Um, you know, are you, I see you can make JavaScript and you can put all those options, but can you put those in the command line or they're just the one submit line so you don't have to make a job script. You can just say job name is this, the count is this, time is this, and then run like a wrap function, like the dash dash wrap I use a lot. Yeah, so you could do that from the command uh, option. You can't, we don't have it right now for, uh, for that. So that comes more into the idea of um, like our templatized jobs, I think would, would, could come into that. Um, and that would be something similar to what we wanna do is essentially you have, you have the job that you wanna do um, and then you just wanna change some, some inputs to that. Yeah. Um, and so we would have a way, we're, we have a way right now that uses containers. And so the container would, would just have um, some options that you can that you can give to that container and that container would run uh, with those options and so that could be a way to um, to do something like that yeah I mean you know there's two things that I, I use a lot is one is the wrap function just to run something quickly okay and the other is to give a small a submit script but then give options to that submit script right yeah yeah I don't think we have we don't have ways but that's a that's a little bit of a limitation on the like API well, side that, that, yeah 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 so is the mechanism for downloading files this this mechanism where you yep. ls and then you use that file object to download yep. itself? Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of the, the way to, to download files. This uses the um, did I close? Oh, here it is. There's no like perlmutter.download here. No, it's this it uses this utilities download uh, function uh, to download it. Um, and this we only recommend for uh, like small files um so i don't know if we have like that'd be something to ask a bore of if there's a like size limit um for it i don't know what his timeout is for for how long he lets that download open for um, but yeah i think the the if you want the if you want longer downloads larger downloads then it's a little bit up to you, but I would say just go to the Globus API um, and use the Globus API in order to do that. And again, if you're already in Python here using the client, Globus has a nice uh, Python SDK that you can use uh, and handle everything on your own there. How closely tied or do you have plans to tie it to the, the GitLab sort of continuous integration sort of framework? I think so. I'm not um, I'm not totally involved with the GitLab integration. Um, but I think that their plan is to use the SF API uh, and the SF API client in order to facilitate that. Um, again, it's yeah, keys. A, it's keys that's always the issue. Well, well, well so uh, I mean, GitLab gets around that. I don't. I don't have to submit keys at all. I'm like the functions always run whenever I submit. That was on Corey. We don't have it set up on Perlmutter. Uh, I run on Perlmutter, so. I can uh, check, sure you have, but. Oh, you're, you set up your own GitLab runner yeah. and it's calling out. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay. So, so, you know, I, I do that, but, but one of the pain points is, you know, job management. Like I need to submit jobs to know that it's going to work. And right. Not. So monitoring in my own little loop to S, S account and see if things finished or not. Right. And this would be much nicer to do if it, if it worked, but if I have to do the keys, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, because it, it, it's submitted out, right? Because right. I'm still running the runner on Perlmutter uh, through the S contact thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, keys are always just a, a hard... I know there are ways to get around, uh, like, it's not really getting around, it's using different features, uh, but because you've submitted a job, that job can, and it's submitted as you, it can do whatever it wants, and if it's going to call out to, to GitLab, then that's okay. But yeah, I think the extra parts of, of submitting the job like that, they but, need... But it's also calling GitLab, it's, it's in NERSC already, so it's, it's the GitLab, the, the software version of GitLab that's running on Okay. Oh, it's the nurse GitLab. Yeah. Okay. And it's using that. Yeah. Okay. It's not an external GitLab because I know that people also use external GitLabs for. I did have an external GitLab on Cori, but now that you have one internally, I use that one. Okay. So is that the software.nurse.co? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. We've been trying to do that but so from software.nurse.gov of without anyone having to set up anything on their own they have that automatically submit the jobs um for you using yeah. sf api but that's not you still have to you're still doing something on your own at the moment right to no no, no. I, I set up a scron tab that um keeps a runner going right uh, you know get that runner going um but then every push i do to Bitbucket. Yeah. Triggers a, a Triggers that. Well, what our hope is, is that instead of everyone having to set up their own scron tab with a GitLab runner, that we would have a set of runners that let you go automatically from, sure. yeah. from there. So that's the, that's the part that we'd like to like take out because that's a barrier to entry. Right, but you'd have to work out the key management so that the jobs yeah. can be submitted just like Git runner can do. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the, I think that's the, we have some ways of automatically getting, so we've switched over. Um, if you've gone on to MyNERSC recently, uh, MyNERSC actually uses uh, SFAPI to do a lot of its work uh, at the moment. So it is getting a, like that token for you automatically. Um, and so that same idea could be used for uh, the GitLab runners to be able to help GitLab get those keys for you automatically right. on a like push code up that gets you a new key that key is used then to start up your runner and start uh, start a job if, if need be. Okay. Yeah. Are there um, breaking changes in 0.0.7 .0 version of this library? Because I accidentally got the latest version instead of 0 .0 0.0.6 and I'm running into these Pythantic user errors when I'm trying to submit a job. Yeah, that's why, sorry, I. Uh, didn't realize that until the other day. Um, and uh, so we updated Pydantic from version one to version two. Um, and in version two, some of the functions broke without us realizing it. Um, so 0.0.6 still uses Pydantic one. Um, and so <laughs> because I only realized it a day ago or two, um, I didn't have time to go fix that before. Uh, before the doors. Yeah. Okay, so good. so not in, something like Yeah, yeah. So in the future, we'll have um, uh, Pydantic tool will be supported, and all of those should work. Um, everything's the same. We just changed the underlying. Pydantic is the is the model generation uh, that we use. So that takes in the JSON from the output of the API and converts it into all of these uh, Python objects for you. And so right. they just okay. had some they had they had some breaking changes, and we had a change and didn't update everything properly. I see. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Great. Yeah, if there's no more questions, then, then yeah. Aaron, do you have any more, any more closing words? Um, Matt, <clears throat> please fill out the survey. <laughs> yeah. That would help us. Um, it's it's in the doc, it's in the slides, it's in the chat, it's in the invite, uh, and we, so I hope everyone has access to it. So please leave us some comments uh, to improve the training, to improve uh, the API himself. And if you, and please, I also put a section in where you talk about how you would, you intend to use the API. Uh, I think that would also be helpful. Uh, for us, so yeah, uh, every every 
every word helps. And I was just gonna say th thank you for for coming and uh, for listening in on this uh, tutorial. Yeah, thanks for the training. I'm just gonna...